Well, I just remember him being a very nice man. And everyone in Brockness knew Mr Whittington because he'd been here for so long. Well, my parents had known him also because of going to church and because he was a person in Brockness who was always round about and because of his lovely little um, forest toy shop, which one used to go and look in the window and buy the odd thing. I like to go around the antiques markets and I saw a couple of little beagles and I was rather intrigued with the way they were made. Um, so I bought them for five pounds and tried to find out a bit more about them. And that led to me finding out about all of Forest Toys. Francis Herbert Whittington, an artist and cello player, was born in 1876 in London. He was the fourth of eleven children and a descendant of Dick Whittington, Lord Mayor of London. In 1910, at Kenley All Saints Church in Surrey, Frank married Marjorie Florence Hood, a fellow artist, and they went on to have two children, Ian Peter and Pauline. During the Great War, Frank worked in Southampton making ammunition boxes, and this could be where his love of wood began. After the war, Frank and his family moved to Brockenhurst, and he took up his interest of carving wood by making toys on a small scale in his home. He must have moved to Edgemore House somewhere, well, around the First World War time. His house and the cottage was just before the turn into South Wears on the main road. It, it's called by the local people, it's called the Upside Down House and it looks out over the forest. He may have started off in the house, but then graduated to the cottage. Then I believe he had a shed as well on the premises, which he would have needed because there was uh, 16 workers, I believe, at the height of the factory, so he would have needed a bit more space. He had uh, fretwork carvers, cutters. He had people that did the carving. Uh, then he had the paintresses who would sit at the benches, painting all the details on. Frank Whittington used to go to zoos. He would do the initial drawings, he would come back to his studio and he would draw the outlines. And he would draw the outlines separately for the three sections. And he would draw the middle with a head, a body and a tail. And then he'd draw the outline for the right side and the left side. And these were then turned into lino prints. The lino prints were put onto the wood um, the planks of wood could be up to five or six thick, clamped together. So there was all these back legs, front legs, and they would be carved on a fretwork thing. They would take the three sides, they would smooth them all, glue them together, and then got passed on to the carvers, who would then put the character into the figures. And one of the sets I think is possibly the rarest of all. It's um, a prototype set that they were using to try and finalise the sort of designs they were, they were going to make. And it was carved by um, Fred Todd, who actually lived next door to um, the factory. And his sister, Mrs Chisman, who was a good friend of mine, um, gave me the set and told me the story behind it. And some of them um, are as many as seven pieces or more. So it's not as simple as three, but it meant it could be a production line. And that's one of the reasons sometimes the lions will have a leading right foot and sometimes a leading left foot because when they were initially stuck together it didn't make any difference which way they stuck them on which makes it more interesting. When I became really interested in, in riding and got Kim uh, my parents very kind of suggested would I like a model of them and Mr Whittington was making models at that time and of quite a few people that I knew because we're all the same age. So 
rode down one morning and Mr. Whittington photographed Kim from back, front and every way. And uh, then I should think about two months later, the model was finished. Yes. And he did a lot of, of models of my, my size, which was slightly bigger than the normal ones, of, of uh, military figures in Brockenhurst. I do like my, my, um, my soldier there. I think he's a very beautiful soldier. I think he's one of the rarest ones I've ever found anyway. He did commissions for the royal family after they went to the um, trades exhibition in the 1926, I think it was. Queen Mary was visiting and um, the Prince of Wales was, was hanging back and she turned to him to see what was keeping him and uh, he was looking at the Noah's Ark and he was really, really taken with it and Queen Mary put in an order and that really made them. And after that, the workroom was busier than ever, the factory was busier than ever. It was something um, we just had as a kid and played with it as kids do, that was our, you know, but sending the animals up the ramps, down the ramps, and but unfortunately it went. It's not very pretty, but then that's suitable for Noah's Ark, isn't it? And I think Frank did like realism. Um, it's got wheels, so you could pull it along with a piece of string, which was good fun. The door slides shut, the roof lifts off. You can get quite a lot of animals in there. Not all of them, poor things. Some of them's gonna go drown, but uh, you can fit a good few in there. And what children used to do is if they were lucky enough to be bought the ark, they would go down to the shop with their pocket money and say, oh, I'm going to buy a tiger today, or I'm going to buy a monkey, or whatever. Well, it was advertised in the local magazines, but also in some of the um, rural magazines that were produced, rural trade magazines. The cruise ships used to come into Southampton, and they'd heard about this um, unusual, but typically English factory. So they used to hop on the train, come down to Brockenhurst, and could just walk from the train station to his house. And they used to buy things from the window there. And so often the um, tourists were so thick and milling around that the workers could hardly get the work done. I think it was just something that um, the kids loved. And even adults liked them. And a lot of people I knew, I think their parents bought them as much for themselves as they did the kids. The safari was a, a set that you could buy. A lot of the toys were made in sets, there were boxed sets. But what amuses me is the oasis is exactly the same shape and size as the pond in the farmyard and the pond in the jungle set and all the other things. Well, he never lived, missed an opportunity. He, heard, he was already making camels because he had all the animals for the ark. So he thought he might as well put some riders on top. And then he made some very straightforward, quite boxy buildings that would be Arab type buildings and made a boxed set. Some of them were phenomenally expensive for the time. I mean, I've got a, a game set and it was 60 guineas. It's a horse racing set. It's an enormous flannel layout of a horse track and water jumps and all the horses and riders. It was really expensive. He sold them to Harrods, some of the other big stores. He sold them to, uh, through Beals. Um, he also sold some of the things to the local chemist shop. So you could go in and buy a pound of cough drops and a dog. Not all the toys were mass produced, and Frank, being a regular churchgoer and church warden, made nativity sets for several Hampshire churches. Uh, it was a nativity set, which is, uh, I, I think I quite like it. It's like brought out every year, and hopefully will continue to be brought out every year. I can't remember how many churches he did them for, but I did see a figure somewhere. I just can't remember how many there was. About half a dozen, I think, something like that. And also that he did a slightly bigger model of a shepherd with a, a sheep over its shoulder. He did um, small uh, nativity scenes and there's a big cutout, so it looks a little bit like a theatre. You could slide the lid off the box and put it behind the open window, so it was a desert scene. And then, of course, he could use his um, sheep and donkeys and anything else that was already available. And he had the wise men and Joseph and Mary and the babies. With the start of the Second World War in 1939, things became very difficult for Frank. 
and I suspect, reluctantly, he decided to close the company, giving his workers just a week's notice. It was the outbreak of the war and the difficulty of getting the deal from America. All the men, all the men went off to war anyway, so he'd lost all his workers, and the girls would similarly have gone on to the land army and so on. Um, I think he probably continued to sell the ones he made, and he probably continued to make pieces for people for commissions, which were in a different size. Had the war not happened, he would have. I mean, it was very successful. But had the war not happened, and he had to close anyway. I think by the time the war had finished and I think age probably caught up with him and he just decided that he was going to retire and that's what he did. He went and lived for a time opposite to me at Little Prescott's. So I'm guessing he went from Edgemore to Little Prescott's probably in the 50s and stayed there until he moved into the Walksplash Hotel as a permanent resident. I suppose is when I used to see quite a bit of him walking in and out. I think he went blind, poor man, towards the end of his life. And one of the O'Donnell brothers used to go and see him regularly and take him out for a walk. He left to go and live with his son probably a year or so before he died in 1973. I often wonder if he had all, sometime during his soldiering, I don't know the right word, uh, been abroad and seen the toys being made in Germany or if he also thought it up himself. It's toy making of the era. We, say we're talking about a hundred years ago, but we did have two toy makers in the village. We had um, the Popes, who used to make um, wheel, horses on wheels, and they were quite well known at the time. And that was prior to Whittington making his toys. I, I think that's it's a nice legacy to leave, and that shows how toys were made at the time and how they survived, basically. Because they have, they have kept well. They're still, you know, hundred years on. There's still loads of, loads of the, the toys around. <laughs>